Hello to you. My name is Bill Blakemore. I'm one of London Corporate Training's trainers. I have worked for them now for about eight years and I focus on topics frequently to do with risk and risk is the subject matter of what we're going to be looking at today. And the reason we're looking at risk is because I'm a lawyer. I practiced as a barrister for a few years early in my career and if lawyers are about anything they're about managing risk for their clients. So if you find yourself on a training course with me at some point in the future either an online course which I do or face to face in London perhaps we'll often be looking at the subject of risk. Maybe risk within contracts, risks within organizations uh, or other subjects uh, which touch on the question of risk. So we need to think about what actually is risk? After all, we use the word all of the time, but I think we should start off with some definitions. The definition I like most is one that uh, Johnson & Johnson use in their risk framework. And it goes like this. Risk is viewed as the combination of the probability of an event, and we're usually talking about an unwanted event, and the impact of its consequences. So that means when we're thinking about when bad things happen, we're considering how likely is it a bad thing might take place, and if it does happen, how serious will that be? What will be the gravity of the situation after that risk has occurred? In the slide in front of you right now, you can see a number of people who are clearly managing risk, either because they've been told to or because they feel it's the right thing to do. Look at those people who are doing social distancing in the bottom right hand corner, standing two metres apart outside a shop. They're queuing up. They know they can't bunch up together in a queue in the normal way because there's a risk that they might catch this awful COVID-19 virus from somebody elsewhere in the queue. So they have to stand apart. Or the folks in the centre of the screen. There you can see the message, stay at home. Queda ta casa, stay in your house. Um, and that's because the Spanish government have required people to do just that. Otherwise, you can see government there taking place. In fact, the House of Commons, bottom left-hand corner, front bench for the government, and people sitting apart from each other. In fact, shortly after that picture was taken, the parliament itself shut down for a period of weeks. So in thinking about risk, what I want to do is to go back to a kind of classic eight-step approach to how we might manage risks uh, in a structured way and then perhaps come back and look at it from a COVID-19 point of view. The first step in this eight-step methodology is rather obvious. I guess you have to identify what are the risks that could take place. Look at those guys sitting on that uh, girder uh, uh, above, the streets, uh, the, above the streets of New York City, Manhattan. That's actually a photograph from the 1930s when those people were involved in the construction of the Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. They're not wearing any personal protective equipment, any PPE. They're just sitting there, some of them. I think the chap on the left is having his cigarette lit by his colleague. Uh, a couple of steps further along, you can see somebody reading the newspaper. Others are having their lunch. Some people are just staring there, staring into, into space. I often wonder what happened to the uh, space on the right hand side of that picture, the empty space. Was there a man sitting there and he's taken the rapid descent approach to getting off that beam? Is he now sitting or lying on the sidewalk below? We'll never know. We don't know too much about the background of this particular photograph. But it's a real one. It wasn't made using Photoshop. So in trying to identify risks, I like the approach of using one of the great uh, creative thinking tools the mind map. And you can see on the right hand side of this slide a simple mind map asking the question in the middle, what are the risks? And then around the perimeter in a sort of like the petals of a daisy, you can see various categories of risk uh, under which the question can be analysed. And that's how mind maps work. Think of some categories, generic categories perhaps, that you elaborate on so that uh, you can come up with answers to the question, what are the risks in this particular situation? If you were to apply this mind map to our picture of the uh, chap sitting on the beam, then of course one can identify straight away some health and safety risks. 
the possibility that one or more of them will slip off the beam and crash to the ground. That clearly would be very serious indeed for the individual. It would probably be serious for the company as well. After all, if you allow your workplace to be so dangerous that people are dying as a result of working there, that's not good news either, is it? So we have the health and safety risks to the individual, but we also probably have some regulatory and compliance risks to the company because it may well find itself in front of a regulator looking to fine it seriously or even close it down for running an unsafe workplace. Having worked out what the risks might be in a given situation, you move on to the second step. And in this one, what we're doing is looking at the probability of the particularly bad event taking place. So how likely is it to happen? My recommendation is to think about this using your judgment and give each uh, risk uh, element that you've identified, give each risk a score, perhaps a score out of 10. So you might say, what's the probability of somebody falling off the beam? And you would say, well, perhaps it's, uh, it's actually quite low because those workers have sat on that beam many, many times. So the possibility of them falling off the beam is quite low. Perhaps it's just a two out of 10 case. When it comes to health and safety matters, if you're talking about people dying, then even the probability of two or three out of 10 is not acceptable, is it? So we're all thinking about the next step very shortly. So having given a score for probability for each of your major risks that you've identified, your third step is looking at impact. Essentially, how serious is it if this risk takes place? And impact can also be assessed with a score. So what you end up with for each risk are two scores. One for how likely it is the risk will occur. And the second one, how impact will it be, impactful will it be if it does occur? This leads us on to step four, where we use the data that we've created with our analysis of probability and impact, and we plot the data on a graph. We create a kind of map. And that's what you can see in the slide in front of you right now. So if we look at the risks set out uh, going from letters A to G, you could work out from their positions on the chart how likely it is and how impactful it will be if any of these risks do take place. Look at risk A, for example, in the top left-hand corner of the chart. Now, risk A is quite a long way up the probability index, isn't it? The upright axis, the y-axis, is the probability axis here. And I would say that risk A has got a likelihood, a probability of perhaps 8 out of 10. That's pretty likely. But if we imagine a line going from where risk A is on the chart down to the x-axis, the horizontal axis on our chart, you can see that the score for impact, which is what the, the x-axis is all about, the score for impact is actually rather low. So this would mean that we have a risk which has a very high probability of taking place, but if it does happen, it won't matter very much. It will have low impact. So if you were stepping out of your house in Britain tomorrow and you were thinking about the possibility of it raining and the risk associated with that, risk A might well represent your thinking. After all, it rains a lot in Britain and when it does, it has a, usually a very low impact. We're used to it raining here. We carry umbrellas, we wear raincoats, so we are well able to deal with any light rain that might take place. Contrast that with risk E. Risk E in the bottom right hand corner of our chart. Risk E is a kind of mirror image of risk A. It has a very low probability of happening, but if it does take place, the impact will be great. So for example, is if we were assessing whether there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow. Here in Britain, we do have earthquakes. They're very rare. And when they do happen, they tend to be quite small scale. So risk E perhaps represents the possibility of an earthquake happening in the UK. Very low chance of it happening. But if it were to happen, if it was one of those very rare occasions where the earthquake did happen, it could have a quite a big impact on the location where it took place. So all around that chart, you can see risks with different degrees of probability and different degrees of impact, which uh, we distribute around. And by turning this information into a map, 
we're able to make a good assessment of risk. Step five is a kind of variant of step four. And in this case, what we do is actually recognize that we have limited priorities, let's say limited resources, which we have to use in a priority way. So we put in a line, a kind of tolerance line, which tells us, first of all, how close uh, various risks are to being ex essentially acceptable and how far away some of us might be. Um, and it also is a way of differentiating between risks that we can manage and those which we must do something about, uh, otherwise they're not under our control. Like the insertion of the scores for all of our risks, the insertion of this risk profile uh, tolerance line is also a matter of judgment. And the more information, data that you have, the greater you're going to be able to fine tune the information you can see on a chart like this. I think it's worth saying at this stage that we should recognize that this approach of assessing probability and impact works pretty well for most risks that we might come across. But there are some risks which are so unlikely, so have such a low probability score, and yet have a, such a high impact score that we tend not to think about them very much. And you might like to consider whether the coronavirus epidemic is in that category. Who really thought it would happen? And now we're in it, we know that it is a very serious matter that we're trying to deal with, causing huge loss of life. So these risks are sometimes referred to as black swan risks or black swan events. After the book written by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, called the Black Swan, who assessed the impact of the highly improbable. I recommend the book to you. Now, if you were coming to one of my classes, uh, at this stage, I'd be getting you to stop listening to me and start doing an exercise. And here we have an exercise in front of you right now. Uh, the exercise is set in the near future. It's set in September, later this year, 2020. Uh, and it's to do with two characters, uh, uh, Aussie, uh, and his uncle Tino. And uh, Ozzy and Tino are thinking about doing a road trip. Ozzy's had a rather unlucky time of it recently. He was ill during uh, a lot of April, but of course he wasn't tested for the virus. Hardly anybody has been. Uh, but he feels better now and he's looking forward to having a holiday. He decides to go to Italy. And that really suits his uncle Tino a lot because Tino wants to buy a Lamborghini sports car. And you can see one of the recent Lamborghinis pictured on the slide. That is the Lamborghini Urus sports utility vehicle. I don't know what you think about that. Personally, it's not my kind of taste, but it suits Ozzy. He really wants one of these and so does Tino. So they agree to fly to Bologna, which is near the Lamborghini factory, and then to drive the Lambo back to the UK through Switzerland and France under the Channel Tunnel, I'm uh, uh, sorry, under the Channel, uh, via the Tunnel, uh, back to London. For Ozzy and Tino, the opportunity of buying a Lambo seems to be too good to be true. They're priced at an extraordinarily low rate at the moment, maybe because uh, Lambo's got a big stock of unsold Lamborghinis. Um, and there are some uh, other attractions. For example, uh, it seems that you can get a loan from Lamborghini uh, to buy one of these uh, cars uh, from them. According to the Italian government, uh, Italy is now free, more or less, of the virus, although it would seem that the Italian media continue to report cases. It would be unfortunate if Ozzy or Tino were to catch the virus, particularly because Tino has some underlying heart problems not the kind of individual who should be catching this virus. It could be extremely serious for him. Anyway, you've got the facts of the case there. So what I'd be getting you to do now, if you were sitting down with me, is carrying out an assessment of risk for Ozzy and Tino on their Lamborghini trip. This is the route they would follow. And my exercise would be asking you to identify probably about six risks coming out of this uh, little trip. Uh, perhaps under one or more of the categories of risk set out on the mind map. So for each risk that you would be identifying, 
I'd be getting you to get a score, to assess a score in terms of probability and impact so that we can plot the risks on a chart. Here's an example. Let's assume that Ozzy and Tino take their dog with them uh, on the trip. They take him on the plane and then they put him in the car coming back to drive back from Bologna. When they get to the French border, they're stopped there, they open the door and the dog could run out of the car and run off into France. That would be extremely awkward. They probably wouldn't be able to get the dog back at that stage. So the risk of them losing their dog at the French border is something you might be assessing. Perhaps the probability of such an event taking place is very unlikely. But the impact, you lost your prized dog, that would be very serious. So if you look at the chart here, risk D, D for dog, uh, I put on the bottom right hand of my profile chart. Having a very low probability, certainly uh, well below the two score on our y-axis, our upright axis, but having a high impact above eight uh, on the x-axis, the uh, horizontal axis along the bottom. Remember, I'll be asking you to put in your tolerance line a curve through this chart identifying uh, risks which are above or below the line in order to assess your priorities. So in the class, we'd be coming back and reviewing our results. Probably you'd have done that exercise with some group work and I'd be saying, OK, let's look at the last three steps of my eight step plan. Step six is where we actually start to do some work with our assessment. We would be looking at what would be our responses to the risk. Essentially, there are four kinds. The fourth sort of four kinds of risk are as follows. You could eliminate or avoid the risk. In this case, not going on the trip would, of course, eliminate all possibilities of the risk associated with the trip. But then Tino wouldn't have his Lamborghini, Ozzy wouldn't have had his holiday in Italy, so the price of avoiding the risks would have also been high. We'd have lost the benefit of the trip. If you can't avoid or eliminate the risks, then maybe you look at reducing the risks. That would be our second approach. So reducing the risks here, well, in the case of the dog, I suppose, it would be before you open the door, you chain up the dog. You make sure it can't run out. If it's a question of uh, not catching the virus, perhaps uh, uh, Tino doesn't get out of the car when we get to Italy. He stays uh, in the car and Ozzy wears a mask. Those would be two ways of trying to reduce the risk. Reducing either the probability of catching the virus or uh, maybe reducing the impact of the virus if he catches it. To do that, he would probably also need some medicines with him, wouldn't he? Maybe by that stage we have a, a vaccine or something of that nature. So if he's been vaccinated, then the impact could be less. But in fact, it could be that the probability is reduced as well. We would have to see how the vaccine actually worked. A third way of managing uh, risks, responding to risks, is going to be looking at whether you can transfer or share the risks. Now, in this case, I think the only way of transferring or sharing most of these risks associated with the trip would be to get Lamborghini, for example, to deliver the car to them. So we're not associated with any of those risks on the highway, risks of catching the virus while we're in Italy. Uh, we get uh, Lamborghini themselves to incur most of those risks. Of course, they might do that but they would charge you for it, wouldn't they? So if you like transferring or sharing risks, usually has a cost associated with it. The party picking up the risk on your behalf is going to make a charge to you. The fourth approach to responding to the risks is to say, well, look, I'm willing to respond to these risks by accepting them. I'm willing to take the chance. I can't eliminate or avoid them. I've done all I can to reduce them, either the probability or the impact of the risk uh, occurring. Um, I've transferred what I can, but what I'm left with are risks that I'm willing to accept. My seventh step is thinking about contingency. Now, often when we're thinking about risk, we're actually thinking about risk leading to some extra cost. If a risk happens, we're going to have to pay some money in order to redress the matter. The contingency sum is like a sort of pot that you dip into in order to pay for the effects of the risk having actually happened. Our contingency plan in this particular instance with our trip with Ozzy and uh, Tino 
might be to have a backup driver who could bring the car back if one or other of our main characters gets sick. So that would be contingency. And the final step in our risk management approach is to think about all of the risks, to record them on a chart like this, a risk register, and to use this as a kind of living record of our risk management approach. So if we look at the left-hand column, the extreme left-hand column, we've got a series of risks identified here, four particular risks. We have got our categorization of the risks in the second column, the risk type. I've got two here, two about health and two uh, the others, one about operational and the last one about compliance. We then have our scores for probability and impact, and those scores will change over time. The more actions we take, uh, the scores will vary. We have a traffic light approach, red, amber, green, to alert us uh, visually to which risks we should be focusing on. You can see we have two red risks here that we should be thinking about hard. Columns six and seven are really to do with action, the current controls we have in place, and what further steps we might take in order to make the risks more acceptable, the mitigation options. Because this risk register is a sort of living plan, uh, and plans need actions and dates, you can see we have a target date for action there, the penultimate column. And our last column allocates risk to individual organisations. So in this particular analysis, the risks are allocated to a couple of government departments, the health department and the home office, as well as the police. So each risk has an owner. So that's the eight step plan, quite a lot of steps in the plan. And I have a way of trying to help you remember those eight steps using a little phrase. And that's going to be coming up now on almost the last slide. So the phrase is, I promote intelligent managers to reduce cultural revolutions. And each initial letter stands for one of the eight steps. So the first I, for example, is to do with identification of the risks. Step two, the P in promote, is P for probability. The second I for intelligent relates to I for impact assessment. M for management is about M for mapping. Our last four steps, tolerating the minor risks by putting in that tolerance line. Step six is the one beginning with an R, I called it reducing in my phrase, and that's actually what this is all about, isn't it? It's about reducing risk, reducing by responding to risks. You remember those four different options. Avoiding, mitigating, transferring, or accepting. The C in cultural, in step seven, relates to the C for calculating contingency. And the final step in R for revolutions to do with recording and reviewing the risks. So I hope you like that little phrase. So if you're able to remember the eight steps using that phrase, I promote intelligent managers to reduce cultural revolutions, you're doing pretty well. It works for me, but I have done this before. So my final thoughts on all of this are really to do with the political response that's happening to the lockdown. I really hope that the Politicians who are in charge of uh, locking us down and trying to control the situation we find ourselves in are thinking about the probabilities of new COVID-19 outbreaks. I hope they're considering who is at greatest risk and how those risks particularly will relate to vulnerable people. And I hope they're also using lots and lots of data to inform themselves because risk management needs data. It needs good information. Otherwise, you're really just working with opinion. 